Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Geographic Society of Chicago's June Travel Log. I'm Judy Prophet from the GSC office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Just a reminder, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the webinar, time permitting. If this is your first time attending a GSC event, welcome and thank you for tuning in. The Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about ge geography and its important uses since 1898. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technologies. Through services such as our geospatial technology programs, we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of GIS or geographic information systems to solve environmental and community issues. Together, our board and membership provide education opportunities for students and educators, assist in building geographic materials, collections, and educational and cultural institutions, promote new and emerging technologies in problem solving, and much, much more. Today's travel log presenter is Derek Barthel. Derek, thank you for being with us today and presenting on Malaysian Borneo. Hey, hey, uh, can you hear me all right? Oh, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so I went to Malaysia in uh, February 2023, so just about four months ago, um, and I'll be going through what I did uh, today in this presentation. So uh, just to give you a little um, uh, table of contents here, uh, most, well, I guess the principal reason for going uh, to Malaysia in general was to go to Sipadan Island um, and scuba dive, and I'll get into why it's a place worthy of going all the way to the other side of the planet for in and of itself uh, as we go on. Um, but obviously there's a lot more to do in Malaysia. So um, I did some other stuff. Uh, we also did, uh, and when I say we periodically, I'm referring to my wife and I. So we did this as a couple's sort of trip, I guess. Um, we also did this Monkey River cruise thing in Borneo. Uh, we went birding. Um, and then also in Northern Borneo, we um, got our rescue diver certifications. Um, we also spent some time uh, on both ends of the trip in Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital city. Uh, and then, you know, at the end of the presentation, I always uh, take a bunch of pictures of my food. So there's plenty of that. And then I'll uh, go over all the costs of everything, pretty much everything we did. Um, so jumping into it, Malaysia is here. Uh, I hope you know where this is. Uh, it's basically Southeast Asia. Um, Peninsular Malaysia, which is on the left here, uh, has the capital Kuala Lumpur. And that's the place where most people, when they say they're going to Malaysia, probably wind up. Uh, it's a popular sort of backpacking trail to go, um, you know, from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur and then up into Thailand or uh, vice versa southward. Um, but I didn't spend much time there actually. I spent almost all my time in Sabah, which you can see on the sort of top right. Uh, there's two states uh, of Malaysia that are on the island of Borneo, Sarawak and Sabah. And uh, most of my time was spent here. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, a timeline, um, we first flew in from Kuala Lumpur to Tawau. Then we took a taxi over to Semporna, which you can see straight east. Uh, and then from we had to spend a night there. From Semporna, we uh, had to take a speedboat down to Mabul Island, which you can't even see here at this scale, but it's somewhere over here. Um, and then we flew up, and I'll go all into all the things we did, obviously, but just to visualize it on a map. Uh, then there we went back to Semporna, back to the Tuau Airport, flew over to Kota Kinabalu. Um, before we spent much time in Kota Kinabalu, we spent time in Kinabalu National Park, which is here, and then spent a few days in the city of Kota Kinabalu itself. Uh, and then from there, back to Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the entirety of the trip was about two weeks with, I don't know, maybe 12 of those days being like fully on the ground. Um, and then a day on each end was in Kuala Lumpur, but, you know, so probably 10 days total uh, in this, what you can see on the map here. So uh, just to 
reiterate some of the logistics. We flew O'Hare to Doha, Qatar, where on the way there, we had a short layover. It was two or three hours. From Doha, we flew to Kuala Lumpur, where we had an overnight stay. The next morning, we flew to Tuao, um, and then everything I, I set there. Uh, oh, and then the night in Simkorna. So it was a big, a big pain uh, <laughs> to get to Mabul and Sipadan, as you can see. And then, and then the the speedboat from Simkorna to Mabul Island was about forty minutes. Um, you can see it depicted here in this photo. Uh, once we got to Mabul Island, this was sort of the first view we were greeted with. So um, Mabul is a small island. You can see mainland Borneo there in the background. And Mabo is the base island for scuba diving in um, Sipadan Island, which is another island uh, we'll get to in a moment. Um, the first time I'd ever heard of any of this stuff, um, I was on a scuba dive trip to in North Sulawesi, Indonesia in 2018. And somebody told me about this, uh, this scuba hotel that was on a, um, a retired oil rig. Uh, that they had shipped, they had floated the oil rig all the way from the west coast of Mexico to uh, here, and then painted it and turned it into a hotel. And that's what you can see sort of in the background here. Uh, that is that is a converted oil rig turned into a, a scuba dive hotel. We didn't stay on it. Um, actually, when we first started planning this trip, uh, we had originally bought tickets to travel in July 2020, and we were planning to stay there. It's called Sea Ventures Dive Rig. Um, and that trip was canceled uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, this is the rescheduled version of it, February 2023. And we opted to stay not at Sea Ventures, um, but at Scuba Junkie, which is where I'm taking this picture from. So this is on the actual island. And the reason we didn't stay at Sea Ventures was just because it seemed like it was uh, having a slower time starting back up to be sort of a social place. Um, there just wasn't that many people there yet in February 2023. I think it's changed since then. But by all accounts, it's supposed to be really cool. Um, Scuba Junkie 2 uh, uh, had a really good promotion during COVID, like in, in I think, in 2020 where it was basically, hey, if you give us a down payment now, uh, you're guaranteed 40% off uh, and you can dive anytime in the next five years or something wild like that. Don't quote me on the exact, but I gave them a bunch of money immediately. And then um, we basically had this whole dive excursion at about 40% off the you know present day price. And I'll get into the prices again later. So uh, here in the, in the middle, you can see the Malaysian flag. Uh, and then on the left is the Saba flag uh, depicting uh, Mount Kinabalu, which we'll also see later. And then on the right is the Paddy flag, which is one of the internationally recognized scuba dive accreditization organizations. So this picture is taken from the jetty at the very end of the pier, where you can see in the bottom left the boat, the speedboat that I was on in the previous photo. We land here, we get off, get all our bags, and then head into uh, check into our rooms. Um, this is basically the opposite view turned around, um, and this is the end, again, the end of the pier. Uh, so Mabu Island, like I said, it's very, very small. It's got a population of about 2,000. Um, lining this coast of the island is basically a bunch of dive resorts, and then um, on the other side of the island is like the actual functioning village. Um, this was our room for the week. We were here about a week. Um, or maybe five, six days. I forget exactly. I can look into it if somebody asks. Um, this was our room. It also had a private bathroom, which is right sort of to my left in this photo. And then this is what the actual like grounds look like. Um, there's the main pier, which those first couple pictures were taken from. And then this is the actual hotel with the bungalows. Um, one of mine being one of those on the left behind the trees. And then behind me in this photo, there's the restaurant and like another social area slash bar. Um, this is the social area up front. Um, you can see again, like all the way in the back, if you squint really hard, that Sea Ventures dive rig peeking through underneath the wooden board. So this is the same view, just a few steps back. Okay, so. Uh, the reason why we came here, Sipadan. Um, Sipadan is a very, very uh, world famous place to go scuba diving. 
Um, the reason, the main reason is because, so Borneo, of course, is a big, big island. Um, Sipaden is a teeny island off the coast of Borneo, but what's special about it is that it's not on the same continental shelf as Borneo itself. It's a volcanic uh, sort of solo island that rises uh, all by itself out of the bottom of the sea uh, and then just barely penetrates the surface of the ocean. And um, for that reason, because it's so close to the mainland, but it's like its own cone, conal shape, it gets a ton of migrating species of fish uh, and the currents sort of like uh, shoot them around the island. So a lot of fish use it as a migratory point and there's a lot of resident uh, fish as well, um, which we'll see in, in the next couple of photos. But uh, just to give me an idea of how things are structured at the scuba junkie, there's a bunch of diving around Mabul as well. Uh, and another island nearby called Kapolei. And the way it works is the government highly regulates how many people can dive sip it in in a given day. Uh, you have to book, I think, at least three days at uh, any of the dive resorts, including Scuba Junkie, in order to get one day at sip it in. Um, and there's three, I think only two dives a day now at sip it in. But when I booked the, when I booked everything, um, it was locked in at three dives a day. So uh, actually, some of the people that we were on the trip with had to go back in a boat, and then we got an extra dive because um, we had booked the trip a couple of years in advance. You can see on the left board here how the things are structured. So we were on Sipadan on this particular day. We had, to be, we had to be on the pier at 5.45 a.m., and then it was uh, about a 30-minute boat ride out to Sipadan. And then once you get there, you have to check in with the military police and show them your passport. And then you have to get a, a briefing on the islands about safety and, and where you're allowed to go and stuff like that, um, which is basically nowhere. Uh, there's this stretch of beach. And beyond that, I tried to walk at one point just to see how far the beach goes. And a couple like military guys came out and told me, stop, turn around. <laughs> so it's just heavily, heavily protected by the government mainly because it's a fragile ecosystem and they just don't want people messing around. Um, but also, and this is less important these days, so don't take this as like a big, some big warning, but um, I know about 10 years ago or so, there was a problem here. This is near the border of the Philippines, like the maritime border. And they were having a problem uh, like a decade and longer ago with actually uh, pirates. Um, and there was a couple instances where pirates came and kidnapped all the tourists on the island and then held them hostage. So it's sort of uh, uh, preventing that as well, I guess, in the long run. So you don't get kidnapped by pirates. Uh, but this is the nice beach. Um, and then, yeah, you jump out. Basically, the the there's no... It basically juts down straight into the sea, like 3,000 meters from the island. You wade out a little bit, and then it goes straight down. So you immediately are greeted with these sorts of sites. Um, this one on the left, it's a very uh, famous school of resident barracudas. Um, and the, this is the dive site called Barracuda Point. Um, and they are often seen schooling together like this. And during certain um, types of currents, they actually form a tornado shape. It's called a barracuda tornado. And if you, if it's like, if you're lucky enough, which we weren't, um, you can swim up through the middle of the uh, tornado. So you could be surrounded completely by barracudas. Um, there's also tons of sharks everywhere, uh, mostly reef sharks. In certain seasons, there is schooling hammerhead sharks, but we were not there during that season, so we didn't see any hammerheads. Um, and then that's me on the left. Uh, that's a sea turtle. There's sea turtles everywhere, everywhere. Like you stop counting and like after the, even the first dive because there's just sea turtles all over the place. Um, and then on the right here, this is also another famous schooling, um, uh, it's school of jackfish that lives on the island and you can, t you can see pretty reliably. These apologize for the quality of these photos. These are just my dive guides, GoPro. I am not an underwater photographer. I don't have the means to afford all the equipment, um, let alone, go scuba diving often enough that I would get good at using it. So 
we have to use just the guides GoPro photos. Uh, another famous group of fish that is seen that we saw here, um, but I don't have any photos of is bumphead parrotfish, which are these big ugly fish with buck teeth and they eat coral. And you can hear them chomping, literally chomping the coral like uh, at certain points of certain dives. Um, I know that they're nearby, really loud. Uh, and then this was a leopard shark. This is, I think the only photo in this whole presentation that's not mine. Um, I don't wanna take credit for it. It was another diver that we was in our group that day who did have a big uh, underwater camera set up and he took a few photos and he was nice enough to offer this one over to me um, to show my friends and family. Um, his name was Jonas from Germany. So if he happens to ever see this, that's credit to him for this photo. Um, so that, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but, you know, for the sake of everything, that's what Sipadan's all about. Um, you go there, it's some, some of the diving super calm and you see all those fish and it's just like, uh, breathtaking diving at other points. It's kind of harrowing because the, by the nature of, you know, everything you're seeing, the currents can be really strong. So at certain points we were literally holding on to rocks and pushing against the current. So we didn't get swept out to sea and then have to surface and get <laughs> rescued basically. Um, it, but it was all good. And, um, Luckily, because like I said, they regulate, you can only go to Sipadan once uh, for every like three days you're actually there. The diving around Mabul and Kaplai is also really, really great. Um, it's much, much calmer. Uh, there's not as much of that big stuff. Like the, there's, there are a lot of sea turtles and some sharks, but um, there's not that big stuff like the schooling barracudas or jackfish or parrotfish. Um, actually, it's quite the opposite. There's lots of little, little teeny stuff um, we saw, for example, lots of um, frogfish, orangutan crabs, uh, alligator fish. Um, we saw a bobtail squid, um, flamboyant cuttlefish. We went on a couple night dives and saw a lot of really cool stuff that basically like glows in the dark. We saw uh, coconut octopus. I don't know. The list goes on. Um, we can talk about it later if there are any questions, but. Uh, so we did, I think, a total of 16 dives, um, with six of those being at Sibidan and the other 10 being um, right around here, Mabul and Kapolei, the closer islands to where this resort was. Um, and another fun thing about the resort is it's set up really well to socialize with people. Um, so we ended up making um, a good handle full of friends. Uh, you're always on the boat with people as well, and you have at least one shared interest, scuba diving, so you uh, theoretically should have at least that to talk about. Um, these folks on the left, we made quick friends with. Uh, we're still in a WhatsApp group chat to this day, and um, you know we were chatting with each other as recently as last week, so um, really easy, good sport to make friends with, um, usually a very uh, positive and, and welcoming uh, atmosphere at these sorts of things. Um, so that was it in the, in the, in this portion of the trip. Uh, like I said, on the way there and back, we have to spend a night in Semporna, which is just this little town on the coast. Um, there's not a ton to do there, but there is this main stretch of restaurants and a couple of bars, um, on the seafront. And you can see here that sort of the vibe, um, we stopped here and just had a beer and dinner uh and walked around not a place where you want to really base yourself for more than you know the night or two on the way there and back but there are worse places to be it was totally uh nice okay so the next day we flew from Tawau to Mount uh to Kota Kinabalu on the other uh sort of coast of Saba this flight was super short I think like 45 minutes or something uh descending here uh, you can see Mount Kinabalu, which is what is in the flag the, of Saba. This is the highest point in um, uh, all of Borneo, I think. And just for anybody who's interested, um, the altitude is, hold on, I should have wrote this down. The altitude is about 13,400 feet or just over 4,000 meters. Uh, which is pretty high considering it's like 
where the airplane is right now is sea level. So just that far inland is 4,000 meters. And you can summit that, uh, which is something we would have done if we had more time, but we didn't. Um, also a fun fact, which we'll get back to, back to in the cost section at the end. This flight that I took this picture on cost $5 uh, um, per person, which is just unbelievable, uh, but I swear it's true. Uh, they, we did have to check a bag each way or on the flight and that was $18. So the flight actually cost $23. But if you didn't have to check a bag, it would have been five bucks. All right, so we landed in Kota Kinabalu. We immediately took a taxi to our hotel, uh, took a quick shower. And then I booked this group tour, one day, like eight hour tour to um, do this Monkey River cruise because I wanted uh, to take some photos. Like I said, I'm not an underwater photographer, but I do like taking above land photos. And this struck me as a good opportunity. Uh, it was like 40 bucks a person. They pick you up at your hotel. You drive like two, two and a half hours out into this uh, more remote area. And then you get on a boat and cruise the river and look for these uh, proboscis monkeys, which are endemic. And what's unique about them is their nose. Uh, what I didn't like about this was, well, A, I didn't get that many good photos because the monkeys weren't posing well enough, which isn't nobody's fault, I guess. But B, I realized, I forgot after a few years of not having done one, uh, how much I dislike organized group tours. Um, uh, I was just kind of in a bad mood the whole time. It, it felt very like artificial. Um, the people that we got grouped up with were unfriendly. Well, not unfriendly, but like unsocial, I guess. So we were just sitting in silence for the two and a half hour ride. And then it was a whole lot of like hurry up and wait once we got to the the river. And then uh, I don't know, I just didn't, I didn't care for it. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend it unless you really wanted to see these monkeys, which that's understandable because they're, they're cool. But that was my least favorite day of the trip. So I'm moving on. Uh, the next day we woke up uh, at 4.30 in the morning, we got picked up at 4.30 in the morning by Akmal, who's our, who is our birding guide, who I had found just through some back channels, uh, messaging different folks on Instagram and looking for a, somebody to take us out, specifically to go bird watching. Um, we landed with Akmal, who was absolutely great, one of my favorite people on the whole trip. Uh, and he picked us up at 4.30 at our hotel and we drove, I forget how long, uh, maybe two hours up into Kinabalu National Park, which is the national park surrounding that mountain. And we uh, went birding all day. So um, I think he had us back to our hotel by four or so. Uh, and it was, so it was about 12 hours of just, um, you know, we drove up there, we parked, we went hiking a little in the forest. Uh, saw some birds, went back to the car, went to a different spot, hiked around in the forests. And, you know, he knew every single bird, um, every single which way you could hear, he would hear a little chirp and stop in his tracks and then be like, oh, that's a new bird we haven't seen. Let's try to find it. And then we would, you know, stand around and wait uh, for it to show its face. Just a few of the birds we saw. This is a snowy browed flycatcher. Uh, this is a crimson sunbird. These are both um, relatively common birds. These are just some of my more favorite pictures, relatively common birds in Southeast Asia. This one was the special one, Whitehead's Trogan, which is endemic, if I remember correctly, endemic specifically to this Kinabalu area, um, if not Saba in general. But this isn't even, I'm actually upset about this picture because it's a little out of focus, but I we saw it. Um, I snapped this one photo and then it flew away immediately. So I'm lucky enough to have gotten at least this photo, but uh, it's a pretty rare bird and it's difficult to spot. So um, luckily we saw it and I got this photo out of it. Um, and this is just sort of a typical view of what it looks like when we were out birding. Um, like I said, we stopped at a bunch of different spots. Um, none of it was too strenuous uh, in terms of like climbing or hiking or anything. Um, a lot of standing and being quiet and being patient. Um, okay, so Kota Kinabalu is the main city we were based out of for this whole portion of the trip. 
uh, I really, really like Kota Kinabalu. Um, I, to this day, I was thinking immediately afterwards, and I still think to this day, it's one of my favorite cities I've ever been. And it's one of the cities I think, like, I don't know, I could see myself like not just visiting, but living like it sort of had it all going for it. Um, Mid-sized city, about 500,000 um, uh, population wise, there's a lot of Chinese folks and a lot of Filipinos, but the indigenous pop uh, peoples are, uh, uh, might butcher the pronunciation here, but Bajau and then Karasandusun. Um, so it's a pretty eclectic mix of folks, a lot of uh, great food and cultural happenings and um, just a really nice sort of clean walkable, this is like a pretty typical um, boulevard in the, I don't know, downtown-ish area, um, you know, by our hotel. Um, in between our hotel and then uh, we went scuba diving again, which I'll get into in a second, but in between our hotel and the dive shop and the pier. Um, and then also uh, it is right on the water. So there's a whole stretch of like waterfront restaurants and fishmongers and, and markets and stuff. Um, this particular day was Valentine's Day. So we did this nice sunset um uh dinner at an indian restaurant uh that is the sun setting and then in the background there there's actually islands off the coast um and a lot of people who come here for tourism will just do little day trips to these islands there's nice beaches and restaurants um scattered uh throughout them we did visit a few of them because we like i said we went scuba diving here and that's where the all the diving is out on these islands um, so we didn't just do fun scuba diving, though. We actually came here um, with the intention of getting our rescue diver certification. Uh, so for those not really familiar, uh, I'll try to keep this brief, but when you get scuba dive certified, there's a few different um, organiz like worldwide accredited organizations. The main, the biggest one is PADI, um, P-A-D-I. It, it's not without its um problems being the biggest one it sort of tries to gobble every other one up and own a lot of the marketplace but um it's also just you know the most common so that's what you run into um your first scuba dive uh accreditation is just called open water diver and that gives you the ability to go out with a guide up to i think 60 feet uh, deep and then the next one up is advanced open water diver and that gives you I think you can go down to 100 feet and there's a couple other like a lot of dive sites around the world um, you know you'll need to have your advanced in order to go to them because they go to certain depths so that's the reason to get that a lot of divers just stop there because if you're just a recreational then you know there's not too much reason to to go up but if you're interested uh, in going up, the next one up is Rescue Diver. And this one sort of teaches you how to be um, alert to distress in other divers that might be in your group when you're underwater. And if there is some sort of distress, uh, it teaches you how to react to it and how to fix situations. Um, this is sort of the, I think the last, um, the last accreditation in the recreational category of diving the next one up is uh dive master which then you're getting more into you want to um you want to make this a career or like an option for your career um but this one i thought was super important i heard really good things i heard it was challenging but fun uh and that it was uh, a lot of people also will say, you know, do your courses here in Chicago or wherever at home and then go out and do fun dives, you know, out in the world. But I don't subscribe to that theory because this be, having this as your classroom um, is was a lot more fun to me than having it in a swimming pool or something similar. Um, just absolutely beautiful surroundings. And while you're doing your exercises and stuff, there's, you know, fish and stingrays and turtles and stuff surrounding you um and i i wouldn't have it any other way um so literally this picture was taken from the boat and then right after i took this picture we put on our dive gear and jumped in the water and then this is where we were learning um how to do rescue divers stuff uh so 
uh, part of it is you'll go on a, a basically a dive, like you're simulating a regular dive and your your uh, instructor will have you, will start having problems and you need to be alert and aware. And then when they have that problem, you need to go up to them and, and fix it. So for example, their weight belt will fall off and, and hit the ocean floor and you'll have to like tap them on the shoulder and be like, hey, you lost, you know, with hand signals and stuff, you lost your weight belt, let's retrieve it. And then you have to retrieve it, help them put it back on, things like that. Um, then there's funnier things like, for example, we had two instructors with us and they simulated getting in a fist fight underwater. And I had to go up and break up the fist fight and calm them down and then like and separate them and, and take one the one way and the other the other. Um, then also, uh, I think sort of the capstone was this uh, simulation of an unresponsive diver at the surface. So we surfaced from the dive. I looked over um, our instructor had, was passed out at the surface face down in the water and we had to respond to that splash them say hey are you okay um, i'm a rescue diver uh, i'm here to help and then you have to flip them over um, take off their equipment equipment um, start giving them mouth to mouth and then the toughest part is you actually have to get them on the boat um, with your own strength from the water so you have to lift them up from here get them on the boat lay them down and then get the oxygen tank and administer oxygen. Obviously that part is simulated. Uh, there is a real oxygen tank, but once you actually apply it to their mouths, then the, the scene is done and you, you get your notes from the instructor. Uh, it was really great. I highly, highly recommend rescue diver certification to anybody interested. Um, yeah, so while we were out, we, you know, we'd do a couple uh, dives or or practice sessions, and then we'd have a lunch break on one of the islands. Uh, while we were having the lunch break, there's these huge uh, monitors that were walking around looking for some scraps of food. I just thought those were fun. And then after the lunch break, we would do our final dive or two and then uh, depart for the day. Um, this is the crew minus one individual who's not in this photo, unfortunately, because he was really funny. Uh, but this is the crew of the Scuba Junkie Kota Kinabalu. It was my favorite crew of any dive shop I've ever been at. They were just so fun and funny. Uh, and each of the days was just, I don't know, tons of fun. And uh, on the day of our passing our certification, um, they invited us out and we we all went out to this bar actually back in like the neighborhood of Kota Kinabalu where a lot of them lived um, away from all the tourist stuff. And we, we just hung out for a few hours uh, and they were great. So if you're ever there, please do visit um, Scuba Junkie. I'm not getting paid to say this. <laughs> they were just uh, really fun. Uh, so that's it in Saba on Borneo. Um, after that, we flew back to Kuala Lumpur for a day and a half. Um, Kuala Lumpur is a much bigger, bustling city, uh, about 2 million people. Um, here you get uh, the actual Malay with the, the Malay people, uh, ethnic group that the name the namesake of the country comes from. Uh, Kuala Lumpur itself is... Um, big parts Malay, Chinese, and Indian. So it's got, it's famous for having like all three of those foods um, and fusions of them all over the place, which uh, those are three great foods to have um, everywhere. So great place to go eating. Um, here's just a picture of our hotel room in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we just got a small little sort of, uh, I don't know, it's not quite like a cube or whatever, but just a small little hotel. Um, we didn't have much time there, uh, so we had to sort of use it wisely. This place uh, was pretty okay. Uh, <laughs> we went, it's an ancient Hindu temple that they built into a cave a long time ago called the Batu Caves. Um, you can see obviously the statue, but then the staircase on the left uh, that you have to go up. And then on the right here is us going up. Um, and then once you're at the top, then this is the view inside. Um, there's not actually a lot in there. There's actually, you know, the temp the temple, um, but then a couple little trinket shops and then a couple little sort of ceremony ceremonial areas. But um, you know, once you're actually up and in there, 
you're there for about you know 20 minutes before you've seen every corner so there's not a lot to do um i don't regret going because it's you know a big time cultural draw which is always important to see but um you know it was a lot of effort getting there and back um just to spend like half an hour um so take that however you want uh, and then I think we're coming up near the end, but the other thing we did in Kuala Lumpur was just walked around in uh, Chinatown there. We got a uh, couple of drinks, we got some food, and then uh, we did a lot of our souvenir shopping here. There's a lot of little open air markets sort of like this. Um, so on the last day of the trip, we bought stuff to bring back to our families uh, and friends, um, uh, largely from this area of Kuala Lumpur. All right, now the fun part. Uh, so a lot of different uh, food um, photos you're about to see. This was the dining area of the Scuba Junkie uh, Mabul um, that I spent a lot of time on in the beginning. Um, part of the price of the whole like Scuba Junkie Mabul package in uh, included food. Actually, it was like an all-inclusive room, food, uh, scuba diving, transportation i think was all included in the price basically everything except for uh alcoholic beverages so every morning there was this big spread like this and then same thing for lunch and dinner um obviously breakfast lunch and dinner would have different uh items but it, after like two or three days you started to notice that every day you know a lot of the items for dinner for example would be pretty much the same as they were yesterday so not a ton of variety that way but uh, I think you'd have to be here quite a while to actually get sick of it because it was all really good. Um, this was one of the dinner plates, just sort of like, I think it was like a beef curry with vegetables, rice. I think there's some potatoes in the back there. And then they always make a really good hot sauce too that you can add. Um, for the the lunches during the rescue diver certification uh, in Kota Kinabalu, um, we went to an actual restaurant and you could order off the menu um, and it was included in the price of the rescue diver certification. So I never actually handled money at these places, but uh, they had a bunch of different like like soups and curries and stuff. I got uh, just fried chicken wings a couple times, came with rice and the, this like soy sauce um sorry this one's a little out of focus but uh laksa is a big famous dish in malaysia which is basically if you've ever had uh japanese ramen it's it's similar to that but it's a little um i don't know more curried out i guess i would say um but if you like ramen you'll like laksa so definitely give that a try um Roti Kanai is a big time uh, breakfast dish. Uh, I think this is more Indian in origin, but it's it's pretty ubiquitous out there. These are two pieces of like a paratha like bread, you know, sort of like naan, but um, not as dry as naan. Uh, and then it always comes with the side of uh, curry to dip in. And then this particular time it came, that's like a piece of uh, oxtail or something. Um, and this is always super cheap. This is like a dollar. Um, for this whole thing for breakfast. Uh, a lot of Indian food, uh, like I said, uh, this was my dish on Valentine's Day at that waterfront uh, restaurant, um, which was great. I don't remember what it was, to be honest, but uh, if knowing me, it was some sort of spicy curry with either chicken or lamb or something. Um, there's a few, there's South Indian restaurants around too, which, which are a bit rare to find from my experience in Chicago, a lot of the Indian food we have is more like North Indian, um, in general, uh, they do this banana leaf thing where you get different small portions served across this banana leaf and you can kind of mix them together with your fingers. Um, that was really great. And then, like I said, Chinese, uh, food is also everywhere. Um, it's different from the Chinese food we have in the U.S., um, but not different enough that you would think it was like totally just like a different cuisine. Um, you would recognize the general palate. Uh, but this was, uh, I think, in Simporna. Uh, satay is famous if you've ever watched any food in Malaysia uh, video like Anthony Bourdain or YouTube or anything, there's always these satay stands. Um, and these are just meat skewers. 
um, lamb, beef, chicken, a couple other things are always really common. And then that peanut sauce, which you can see on the top right. Uh, in Kota Kinabalu, if you ever wind up there, definitely, definitely go um, to the Filipino market is what it's called. It's one of the waterfront markets. And it's this huge sort of sprawling open air market. Um, a lot of it is fresh fruits and vegetables and meat and fish uh, for people to bring home. And then a lot of it is uh, food stalls like this. So this is a chicken wing stall. Here we got a couple of chicken wings and then skewers um, and they give you some sauce in a bag and you can just sort of walk around and have at it. There's tables and chairs everywhere as well. This is more just the fruit, fruits and vegetables side of things, but this is generally what it looks like walking around. Uh, and then my favorite thing was running into these sorts of restaurants um, because uh, you can pick any of these things on the menu and they will go right across the way and pick up uh, fresh out of the ocean crab or squid or, or prawns or whatever you picked out and then make it up just like this. We picked the, um, what was it? It was spicy chili, hot chili crab, which you can see here. Um, so just grab some crabs right across the way, pull them back and cook them in their like house hot sauce with fresh vegetables. And this was super spicy. This was making other people sitting near us at the table cough when they lit it up because it, uh, it was so fragrant with a bunch of hot peppers and stuff. Uh, Kuala Lumpur, um, there's, in a lot of the places we were at, it's full of shopping malls. Shopping malls are like still a major thing there and in a lot of the world. But um, one place we went was Din Tai Fung, um, which is this relatively famous uh, Chinese dumpling place uh, that has locations in a lot of the world, especially in Asia. I think there's one in Vegas and one in LA as well. Um, so if you've been there, you might have came across it. But this was our second time at one. We we stopped at one in Taiwan um, once a few years ago. And then when we saw it again here, we said, oh, let's stop because they are really good dumplings. Uh, and then if this isn't your first time seeing me present, you know I always try pizza wherever I go. Uh, and this was a pizza place in Kuala Lumpur called the Pizza Mansion, which was uh, legitimately great. Um, I am, I don't even mean relative to the region. It was actually a very, very good pizza. Uh, uh, I'm not ashamed to admit we went twice. We went once on the first day when we were there in Kuala Lumpur, first day of the trip, and then once on the last day of the trip and just got the same thing, this pepperoni pizza again. Uh, Malaysia is not necessarily the place to go for alcohol. It's, it's largely a Muslim nation. So alcohol prices are high. Um, but if you know, if you sort of feel yourself uh, if you feel the place out, you can sort of tell, I don't know what I'm saying, like, you can find a good cocktail bar if you want to, I guess is the point. We did find a couple in Kota Kinabalu. Uh, here's an espresso martini I had. And then this other one, uh, this was some sort of like guava rum thing. And then that's an orange and a piece of uh, burnt cinnamon on top, uh, which just sort of lends to the essence, I guess. Uh, and this was at a place called Tujau. T-O-O-J-O-U, which is also a hotel in Kota Kinabalu that we almost stayed at, but then um, didn't. Uh, just for normal reasons, we chose another place. But we wanted to visit there anyway because they had this nice rooftop cocktail bar that um, was one of the draws that we almost stayed there for. And we went and the cocktails were great. Yeah, it was one of them. Actually, here's another one. They are also like sort of a tiki bar. Anyway, so that's basically the end of the presentation. This is the second to last slide. Um, going down through the costs, um, airfare is crazy right now. Um, back when we first originally booked this trip in for July 2020, I think we booked it in like January or February 2020, uh, which was horrible timing. But back then, the flights from Chicago to Kuala Lumpur were only about $800, and we were routed through Tokyo at the time. This time, uh, flight pr prices skyrocketed. Uh, it was uh, $1,150 per person with the layovers in Doha. 
we actually didn't pay any of this out of pocket. I used uh, points like travel credit card points. So those were zero for us, um, but that's how much they were actually, 1,150. Uh, the domestic flights, like I said, there was that $5 one, but then the other ones mostly were like 40 or 50 bucks, uh, especially if you check a bag, which always costs an extra like 15 or $20. Um, for taxis, we used Grab, which is basically like uh, Uber. It's just an app, just like Uber. If you're just going around town, it's anywhere from like 2 to $4. It's very, very cheap. Uh, the airport runs were about $15. Um, and then uh, hotels, uh, Kuala Lumpur, that little one you saw was about 55. The, the one we had in Kota Kinabalu, uh, the hotel we had in Kota Kinabalu was much more spacious. It was like a normal, totally good hotel room. And it was 50 bucks a night. And then those couple of nights we had to spend in Semporna to and from Mabul, we just got, you know, like a, a, a pretty Spartan hotel room that did the job and it was 30 bucks uh dinner is all over the place you know it depends if you're going to the market and you're just getting chicken wings you could spend three bucks if you're going out to like a cocktail bar and you're spending cocktail bar prices you can spend 20 bucks a person or more there's fancy restaurants in Kuala Lumpur too um where you can spend you know as much as you desire um standard beer is about four bucks and then okay so the good stuff the scuba junkie mobile uh for it was five days four nights uh 16 total dives was 650 bucks per person this would be substantially more if you booked it now uh probably about 50 percent more like i said we got the good deal um locking in you know uh the rate we had uh well in advance and then the rescue diver course was 230 bucks per person um over the course of three days it included about five dives and then lots of instruction and then good company of our guides, lunches and everything like that. A lot of that fee actually goes towards Patty. So what you're paying for is, is the certification um, largely. Uh, the Monkey River cruise that I didn't care that much about was 40 bucks. And then birding uh, was 160 for the day. Um, that included Akmal's time and uh, the wear and tear on his car, obviously, and his expertise well well worth it um anybody here who happens to be here for the birding portion i apologize first of all that it was short but you know how it is uh but if you do want to go here and go birding that is akmal's whatsapp number so please do get in touch with him i highly recommend him and again scuba junkie kota kinabalu um if you're ever in that area uh and with that being said that is the end of the presentation um the last note is just this photo uh, this guy he cooked our lunches on sipadan Island each day um and each day at sipadan we had to pack up and take everything with us because again you're not allowed you know to stay on the island or anything and he would always write by sipadan in the in the sand and then sort of uh dramatically yell out by sipadan and we would all get on the boat and wave goodbye which was always funny uh and that's it that was wonderful thank you so much Derek, for presenting on um, malaysian borneo um it doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment is there anything else that you would like to add um yeah no just uh in general saba i think is a really overlooked place like i've never really heard anybody talk about it um but I, I mean, it quickly became one of my favorite places I've ever been. Like, I don't know, everybody says this about every place, but the people were actually like really cool. Um, everybody I met who is like a person from Saba was super chill and um, relaxed and like welcoming and just like ready to like hang out and talk about whatever, which you don't see in a lot of places um, in my experience. Um, people are you know, if you're a tourist coming in, often guarded, rightfully, in a lot of cases, I think, but there they were just like, I don't know, straight up with you, which was really, really cool. I liked it a lot. Kuala Lumpur, I liked less. Um, that's not to say it's not worth going to or something, uh, especially for food, but uh, people were definitely more like standoffish there, or maybe just like so used to tourists that they didn't, you know, didn't care or just 
I don't know. I don't, we don't need to go into it too much, but it was just a little less like uh, nice to be at, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, great presentation. That's definitely, that's a place I had myself have never heard of. So that's cool that not only did you get to visit, but you got to scuba dive there. So definitely like a full circle experience. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. Everybody have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you, Derek. No, thank you very much.